All right, good morning, everybody. Let's take a seat, and we will get into God's Word together. I am so excited to be here with you guys. And uh, Jamie gave me the, uh, the honor of being able to preach to you guys this, this weekend. And uh, man, what an Easter. How was that? That was so cool. Yeah, that was amazing. We see what God did, see how many people... Uh, he, he reached with the gospel and how many people um, gave their lives to Jesus, just uh, new life. It, it, was, it was so beautiful. Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Jake, and I'm part of the teaching team here at Church of the Outer Banks. And uh, my, my wife and I have, I have three uh, beautiful children, and uh, I'll show you guys a picture here. Here's us in Puerto Rico a few weeks ago. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing time. Yeah, so good. And uh, our family has, has uh, recently been on a new adventure. We, we have uh, two infant twins in our care. So we've, uh, for two week, last two weeks, we've had infant twins. So we went straight from Puerto Rico, um, relaxed, uh, chilling, having a great time, straight into uh, twins, rotations of two, feeding every two hours, and so uh, I'm tired, thanks for asking. Um, my wife, actually, we've been uh, sleeping, I've been sleeping on the couch, taking one, she's been taking the other, and we've been rotating, because one has a little bit more stomach issues than the other, so he doesn't sleep quite as well, but um, we've been rotating, and last night, Nikki took both the twins, and, uh, and I got to sleep a little bit, so uh, I am ready to jump into God's Word. And uh, I'm excited. And you guys have been such a blessing. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you guys for the blessings you've poured out on those little babies and, and helping us to raise them. We knew uh, when we got the call that, that we could take them because we knew we had the church backing us up. We knew that there was a community of, of believers here at Church of Outer Banks that, that loves when people need the, the message of Jesus and loves, and we can give that message to these little babies just by, by taking care of them, by showing love. And, and, um, and this is, it's funny because uh, this is not the first time we've gone to Puerto Rico and came right back and had gotten a baby in our care within days of coming back to Puerto Rico. So our life is a little weird. This is the second time that's happened to us, uh, flying back into Puerto Rico and immediately caring for an infant. So uh, it's a bit of a deja vu for us, but we're just rolling with it and we're, we're excited about it. So um, this morning we're going to jump into back into the book of James. Um, took some time during Easter to celebrate uh, the resurrection, uh, and, uh, and that was so wonderful. And we're going to be jumping back into James chapter 4 this morning. So if you want to open your Bibles with me. Um, this letter was written, just as a bit of a, a reminder, this letter was written by James, and there were a bunch of James in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, sorry, that walked with Jesus. And uh, this James who wrote this book was the half-brother of Jesus. And uh, we say half-brother uh, because, uh, obviously, Jesus' father was God. But w sometimes when we think of half-brother in our context, we think, like, he spent half his time with his mom, half his time with his dad. That wasn't the case. You know, like, Jesus and James were raised under the same roof. And so, really, um, theologically, they were half-brothers, but they spent their childhood together. And so I think that's really important for us to remember as we look at, at what James tells us is, is he had uh, years and years and years of, of living with and watching Jesus do life. And, and so we know from, uh, from the Bible that he didn't believe in Jesus until the resurrection. I, Jamie mentioned last week that the resurrection changed everything for James. Right? And, and we see him uh, in, in, throughout the Gospels. Matthew 13, verse 55 says, uh, Isn't this the carpenter's son? Talking about Jesus. Isn't, this, isn't Mary his mother? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So we see him listed as brothers of Jesus. And in the Gospels, it, it seems that 
James is always listed first. So we, we would think that James was probably the oldest of the brothers and sisters. Um, and so he, he got this special time with Jesus. But uh, we see in John chapter 7 that um, it says, uh, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So, so we see that even though he had proximity to Jesus, he didn't have faith until the resurrection, until Jesus showed himself to him. And, and once James believed in Jesus and that Jesus was truly the Messiah, um, can you imagine the wisdom that he would have had by living and walking with Jesus? Right? He, he becomes the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And just all the years, um, I can imagine once he puts his faith in Jesus, the memories flooding back of how Jesus lived, what he did, how he reacted in certain situations. And, and so I could also imagine, you know, people coming new into the church and meeting James and be like, oh, how long have you walked with Jesus? And be like, well, all my life, you know? And they're like, well, how is that possible? He like, we just found out about him a few years ago. And he's like, well, um, Jesus taught me how to walk. And they're like, right on, brother, me too. Jesus taught me how to walk. And like, no, Jesus literally taught me how to walk. Like, I, I've been with him uh, for, since I was born. And, and just the, the amount of wisdom uh, and th that sort of uh, understanding would give him we see that play out in this book. And, and that's why I mention it, is that as, he, as James, this pastor, writes to his church, this, this group of Christians, and he, he wants to pour out the wisdom that he watched Jesus walk in year after year because he knows it's going to benefit them. And so that's what we're studying this morning. And we're in this section of James where uh, James is, is painting a picture for us of uh, what it looks like to walk in the way of the kingdom of God. And what James says in, in uh, chapter 3 that we studied is that there are two kinds of wisdom. There's a kingdom wisdom, the kingdom of God, and there's a kingdom of this world, the wisdom of this world. And he's calling us to, to walk in the way of God. But he says in, in verse uh, 13 of chapter 3, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, do not cover up the truth by boasting and lying, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kinds of wisdom. So what he's saying here is that the fruit of, of living by the world's wisdom, by the world's set of priorities, is bitterness and selfishness. And who, who would raise their hand and say, I want more of that in my life. Like, I'm, I want more bitterness and selfishness and, and envy and distra distraught and trials. No, no one wants that, right? But that is this picture that, that James is painting of, of how, as we follow the world, that's the fruit. And James is teaching this idea, and he sees it throughout Scripture in the teachings of Jesus. This, James pulls multiple times from the Sermon on the Mount, this, this amazing passage where it's, Jesus is summarizing his whole teachings. Matthew writes, and he summarizes Jesus' teachings in this one uh, section, the Sermon on the Mount. And what, what he's doing is he's, as he paints this picture, we see this idea of the upside-down kingdom. Has anyone ever heard that statement of talking about the, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? It's like it's the world turned upside down. And I love that when the disciples started preaching Jesus, they, there are people that said, these are the men that turned the world upside down. But the, that we're actually called to, to such a radically different life than the world paints a picture of, that it would be an upside-down kingdom. Uh, the kingdom, the, the, the world turned on its head. And Jesus, in the way of Jesus is so countercultural. It, it, Jesus would say things like, um, where the weak are powerful, right? That's backwards from how we would think of it. It's like, 
No, the weak are weak and the powerful are powerful. But Jesus would say, the weak are powerful. That actually there's power in weakness and that suffering leads to glory. These are things that from a world standpoint, they don't make any sense. But James is going to talk to us here about how as we, as we fight to live by God's law and by God's calling, that we actually um, we do things backwards. And the fruit of living by God's calling is the opposite of what the world offers. If the world offers envy and jealousy and rage, that, that Jesus offers peace and joy and love and the things that we actually want we get to by going through the blood of Jesus. So I've called this message this morning, Humility Gives You Wings. And you might, you might uh, n- reference this message a little bit. You might, it might remind you of the Red Bull ad campaign, Red Bull Gives You Wings, right? I was like, I thought of it. I was like, why does that sound familiar? I'm like, ah, Red Bull. And so I did a little, did a little research, and uh, Red Bull has running, been running this ad since 1997. So it's a very long-running, long-standing ad campaign. And it was very different for an energy drink to come out and run these sort of illustrative, um, sort of whimsical things where they drink a Red Bull, and then they, you know, the characters get wings. But in 2014, Red Bull was actually sued for $13 million for false advertising because the plaintiff claimed that Red Bull does not actually give you wings, right? And they lost the lawsuit. They actually had to pay it out because Red Bull apparently does not give you wings. But if you think about the ramifications of thinking that Red Bull gave you wings, it's pretty terrifying, right? So I just, as a, uh, you know, as a, for legal purpose, I wanted to state that, that humility does not actually make you grow wings, but we will see here uh, that, that James is, it will, in verse 10, we'll go straight to it. James chapter 4, verse 10. James says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So there is a truth here that that as the upside-down kingdom, as we humble ourselves, that God actually lifts us up. And this morning, we want to focus on that truth. James said in chapter 4, verse 6, that we read a few weeks ago, God opposes the proud but gives favor to the humble, as he's quoting from Proverbs 3.34 in that section. But what we want to do, we want to focus on that truth in relationship with one another. See, James was a pastor, right? He was a pastor for 30 years, and he, he would have seen day in and day out people come into the church just like you and me and 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 bring our selfishness into the community, right? And he would have seen how that would have destroyed the community when we, in marriages, in relationships with our kids, in friendships, in, in mentorships, when we bring a sense of pride into that relationship, it, it hurts the relationship. So James, as a, as a pastor, he, he would write to this church and he would say, Um, In verse 11, he would say, Brothers and sisters, family, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. James is, is taking this idea of humility, taking this idea of the upside-down kingdom, and he's applying it to our relationships once again. The beginning of chapter 4, he said, this is what causes quarrels and fights among you. When you get this wrong, when you bring pride into a relationship, now he's saying, do not slander one another. What is slander? The Bible uses slander to talk about someone questioning another's authority 
or spreading hurtful lies about them or even saying unkind and unhelpful things about them. And what is judgment? To judge someone is to assume authority over someone. It's saying, I, I know better. Like, I see how you're living, and, and, I, and I can tell that I'm doing it right, and you're doing it wrong. How's that go in your marriage? Not great, huh? <laughs> James, you can almost feel his heart break here when he says, the, the prideful expression of judgment is saying, I know better than God. It's putting myself in the place of God and saying, step out of the way, God. I got this one. I can take it from here. And what does that do? It hurts the relationship, but James tells us it's hurting us. It brings bitterness. It brings discomfort. It brings discord into the body. And, and what's really going on here, and what we don't like to talk about, is we think, well, God's going to love people, right? God's going to love the church. So if God's going to love the church, someone has to judge him. We get uncomfortable. We're like, God is love. Well, but I see, I see things going wrong. I see people hurting other people. I see, like, and we sort of take on this mantle of like, I'll, I'll be the judge. I'll do it. And what, what God's calling us is he's calling us and giving us the freedom to just love people. Like to not have to judge them, to not have to look at our, our wife and think about, or our spouse and say, um, well, I don't know their motives. I don't know why they said that or, or what that was coming from or, or maybe, um, you know, what's in their heart. We can just say, I'm going to lay my life down for you. We don't have to look at our kids and, and say, well, I don't know where that tone came from. We can just say, you know what? God's going to handle that. I'm going to love them. And that is convicting to me. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Yesterday, I was like prepping for my message. And, um, you know, I, I was helping with my son. We were working together. And I was just like, Lord, why do I have to learn these lessons over and over again? Like I was telling him, like, oh, yeah, I'm preaching tomorrow. And he's like, oh, you're preaching tomorrow, huh? And I'm like, man, because I, I spent the day, like, just, like, I don't like that tone. I don't know about that. Like, we, were, we, we do pools together on Saturdays, and pools were not going well. They were dirty. And we're just, like, butting heads, and I'm just going, Lord, why, why I'm so broken? But, but what, what we see is it's so easy for this to creep in. And I can imagine James here just, just heartbroken as a pastor, looking at what this kind of judgment would do in a church. And I don't know if it's too soon, but I think about myself being a pastor. And you know what brings judgment quicker than anything? Bad times, hard times, questions, COVID. And I watched... Our church, I watched the community and the Outer Banks and, and really the, the church at large go to war with each other because people wanted answers and people couldn't trust the Lord. And people instead said, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I have to judge others. I have to take a stand. And there's nothing wrong with taking a stand, but when Christians are attacking each other, it just breaks my heart. And I think it broke the heart of James watching Christians going through persecution and instead of humbling themselves, taking a prideful stand and going, you know what? I don't like what they're doing. And instead of, of humbling themselves and laying their lives down, they, they went, went to battle with one another. And the fruits of it, this bitter jealousy and selfish ambition would tear apart the church from the inside out. So this is serious stuff, right? Like this is, this is not a lighthearted topic. But oftentimes we, we think, well, you know, what does it hurt if I'm like a little judgmental? Or if I see something and um, I, t I tell someone else behind someone's back, like, well, 
I, I just really don't think they're following Jesus. You know, what, what are those words? I think sometimes we, we think lightly of words like that. And what James is saying is it not only hurts the relationship outwardly, but, it, but it's actually hurting us. And, and James would quote here Matthew 7. We don't have a whole time to read it, but this is from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in verse 1, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured for you. So what, what James is reminding us of is that it, as we judge others, it puts ourselves in a prideful state and it actually hurts us. Because then we turn around and, and, and we will be judged for the same way we judge others. And who's, whose job is it to judge? If no one, if, if we, the world needs a judge, whose job is it? Right? In verse 12, we see James says, There is only one lawgiver and judge and one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? He's like, who are you? He's like, did you, did you offer your life on the cross for, for the world? No. Who's the judge? We actually looked at this in, in Bible study a couple weeks ago, a men's Bible study on Tuesday nights. John 5.22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one but this is Jesus speaking, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jesus is the judge. And so Jesus, having given his life, having laid his life down, now is the judge. And so we can trust him. And what law did he give us to live under? Like, okay, so if we're not going to judge and we're going to try and walk in humility, what law did Jesus give us to live under? John 13, 34 says, Jesus said, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. So the new command we're under is to love like Jesus. And we have enough work cut out for us trying to love like Jesus. We don't need to also add being a judge on top of that, right? <laughs> like, like, Living every day loving like Jesus is hard enough. And James is like, please don't add trying to be a judge on top of that. You're just going to bury yourself. You're going to end up bitter. I love how Paul adds to this idea in Ephesians 4 too. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So this is my, my first point, is judge not. How do we do this? How do we wrap our life around the way of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and, and this sort of upside-down kingdom? Like, what's a practical way to live and walk in humility so we're not judging? This is my second point this morning. Become a servant. This is the example of Jesus, right? Jesus lowered himself and became a servant even though he was fully God. Philippians uh, 2, 3 through 9 tells us, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. So very similar. Paul's saying something very similar that James is saying. And then he gives this example. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking a very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name which is above every name. 
That's our example that we're to follow. So a very practical way to live out this humility is find places to become a servant to others. Like, I'll tell you, it's not very... Um, it's hard to be prideful when you're waking up in the morning at 2 a.m. to feed a little baby, and you're like, I can't, I can't even speak. I'm not sure what's going on. Like, like I told you we were in Puerto Rico three weeks ago. I'm not even sure that really happened. It might have been a dream. Like, like, <laughs> like twins has completely erased that. We're like, our family's just walking around in a daze. Like, we can barely form sentences. That's not a prideful way to live, right? But, but it's a wonderful, fulfilling way to live. And I have seen you guys, not to make this about our family, it's just like what we're living right now, but, but I've seen you guys live this out as well. I've seen you say, what can we do? How can I serve? How can we get involved? How can we love others? And I, I, I really, um, I love what God's doing in this community right now. Because I see you guys getting in the game. I see you guys saying, put me in, coach. I just want to serve. I just want to be a part of what God's doing. And it takes humility to do that, right? Because it, the, the, the pride in us would say, well, um, I will serve if I can serve from the front. You know, I, as long as I have a prominent position, as long as I'm like, if people see me and know what I'm doing, then I'll serve. That's not the heart I see in this church, and that's not the heart James is calling us to. The heart he's calling us to is to serve when no one else sees, right? When there's no glory in it for us. Jesus, at one point, he's talking to his disciples. He says, he says hey, when you guys throw a party, don't invite, like, the prominent people, the people that are going to, like, do something for you. Invite those that are sick and lame and broken and poor and hurting. Invite those people to the party because that's where you'll be laying up treasure in heaven. If you invite the people who can do something for you, you've already got your reward, right? And so this is the call that James has put on our lives. As, as, and, and it's so cool because he actually lived this out as well. We see James living this out. When he introduces himself in James 1, he identifies himself not by the brother of Jesus or a prominent pastor in Jerusalem, the head of the church. He, he describes himself as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus. So a very practical, wonderful way to live in humility is to find someone to serve. And sometimes that's as easy as looking in your own home. Find a way to serve your kids. Find a way to serve your spouse. Find a way to serve your mother-in-law, your father-in-law. That might be hard for some of you. I don't know. But, but find a way to serve those around you. And then once you've started serving, you'll see that, that God brings a humility into your life because what we see is when we serve others, when we start looking outwardly, we're like, wow, other, other people have value. Other people, they, they have something to offer me. And the more that you lay your life down for others, the more that you see that like, wow, we're all, we're in this together. It's not me being like, oh, well, I'm in this high place, so I'm going to reach down and serve you. You find that as you serve others, there's a blessing in it for you as well. And, and you can be in community and serving each other, glorifying Jesus together, and then you become stronger. And that's how Jesus has called us to build this community of faith. My final point, and I'm going to ask the band to come up, is... Stay humble, but know that God has more. I think a lot of times we think of this humility as it's like something we do once and then we're done, right? Something we're like, well, I, I was humble, you know? Or, or people ask you like, well, what's, 
what's your what's your favorite attribute? What's your favorite part about you? I'm like, my humility. <laughs> you know, like, like, like we we so quickly slip back into pride, and so it's a, it's a daily struggle to stay humble. And everyone wants to be exalted. We all want to be glorified. And maybe we wouldn't really say that, but but our flesh it it rages and it says, "Honor me." Like, what about me? Just as a key, as a little tip, anytime in a, in a uh, relationship where you're having a disagreement and you say, but what about my needs? You just lost because you just showed your hand. You just told your, the person you're in a relationship with that you only care about you, right? And, but that's the, kind of, that's the kind of ideas that we're just like, what about me? Who's going to take care of me? If I'm in this humble, lowly state all the time, then, then who's going to take care of me? And that's Jesus. Thank you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> but that's the heart is sometimes we're like, okay, I'll, I'll sit in this humility. I, I'll, I'll lower myself. I'll serve others. And that's a beautiful place to be in. But God wants us to stay in that place, but he has more for us. And this is the, the thing that rocked my world about this text this week. Because over and over in Scripture, if you look up humility, if you, if you look up where, where the Bible talks about humility, over and over and over again, we see the Lord say, those who humble themselves... I exalt. Right? This upside down kingdom is like humble yourself and let God exalt you. Not just once, but over and over and over again. One of my favorites is Leviticus 26 13, where God tells his people, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you no longer will be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with your head held high. This doesn't make any sense. We as Christians, especially in the Western culture, we want something to do. Like, I want to do something. I want to be seen. I want, I want to act. God said, I did it. I broke the yoke of bondage. So what are we to do? Matthew 23, 12 says, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. First Peter, Peter says, Peter needed to learn some things about humility as, as you look at the life of Peter, but he got it. He said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Who's going to take care of you? Jesus is going to take care of you. And, and really that gives us this freedom that, that I don't have to be worried about my life. I don't have to be worried about what I'm going to get or how I'm going to be exalted or, or what I'm going to do. Because God just says, I'm going to give you the freedom to love others and to humble yourself and to walk in that humility and to serve others. And you let me raise you up. You let me show you what I can do with your life. So beautiful. I love this and because I think sometimes we get a little bit distraught. We, our strength starts to wane. Because right? being humble and, and serving others, it's tiring. And it, it can leave us feeling used. It can leave us feeling down. It can leave us feeling like, Lord, I'm empty. And what we see in Isaiah 40, 31 is this famous verse says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Humility, laying our lives down, keeping God in the, his place and us in our place, and just looking at serving others, looking at what we're responsible for, looking out for each other. Humility will give you wings, and God will raise you up, and he will do the work. Let's all stand and we'll pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, thank you that you call us to this upside-down kingdom where, where we lower ourselves, we walk in humility, and you raise us up. Lord, you exalt us. It may not happen in, in this world, Lord, but we know we're building up treasure in heaven. Lord, we know that you're a good, good father and you care for us. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, during this time of worship, I, want, I was thinking about this earlier while we were worshiping with our hands held high. I want you to think about this. God's called you to spread your wings. God has called you to, to not stay in that position of, of just being lowly and broken and humble. Yes, we're supposed to stay humble. But God says, I called you out of that in freedom so that you can hold your heads high, so that you can hold your hands up and you can say, this is not a posture of pride. This is a posture of humility. This is a posture of I don't have what it takes. I surrender. God, fill me with your spirit. And this is where we stand. We stand with our heads high and our hands up, broken before the Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you. Let's all worship together.